Look at this Facebook video. This guy's doing Laoja Yilu. Can you believe how bad he is? Look at those stances. There's no connection, no body method. This guy sucks. I know, I'll share this on my page and I'll blast the guy. Hey everyone, look at this guy. He sucks. His entire lineage sucks. They didn't learn the real art. Honey, are you going to class tonight? Yeah, I'm teaching in a few minutes. I'm just finishing up a Facebook post. This guy really sucks. His fajin is pathetic. What are you teaching tonight? Oh, I'm talking to the class about wuda. You know, respect, integrity, honor. I just have to finish tearing this guy a new one first. Oh, what's for dinner? How about a nice big plate of humility? You obviously have no clue about the six harmonies. Wait, what the hell did she mean by that? Calm your mind. Go with the flow. The goals of an internal artist. Intercept. Uproot. Adapt. Unbalance. Neutralize. Control the center. And counter. Never check your brains at the door of a martial arts school. Remain centered at all times. This is the Internal Fighting Arts Podcast. A real-world conversation about the internal martial arts and philosophy of Chinese Gong Fu. Here is your host, Ken Gullet. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Internal Fighting Arts podcast. I'm not beating around the bush today because we have an international podcast. Do you practice Wuda as part of your martial art? Okay, you know your forms, you know your applications, but do you make Wuda martial morality? part of your daily life? Have you cultivated both your body and your character? Wuda includes humility, integrity, respect, honor, courage, self-control, honesty and sincerity, perseverance, loyalty, and more. These are qualities that are common in cultures and societies throughout the world, regardless of religious beliefs, regardless of nationality. It's easy to talk about Wuda in a dojo or a kun. When I took my granddaughter to her Taekwondo class, all the students recited the Taekwondo pledge at the beginning and the end of each class. At the end, they would say, I shall live with perseverance in the spirit of Taekwondo, having honor with others, integrity within myself, and self-control in my actions. Almost all martial arts have some form of wuda, but having wuda means much more than reflecting it in class with a teacher and other students. Do you reflect it in your daily life? How about your online behavior? Today I'm talking about wuda, and for the first time I have two guests. Both of them have been guests before. Both of them practice primarily Xingyi Chen. Jonathan Bluestein is in Israel. Byron Jacobs lives in Beijing. This is a long program, so let's get to it. In martial arts, we're supposed to master our bodies and the techniques and principles of our arts, but we're also supposed to work hard to master our minds. So through martial arts, we correct our character and cultivate the body. And yet, when we see the way some martial artists behave in all styles, we see the same thing that I personally see in religion humans failing to live up to their philosophies. So I'm going to kick this off, just open it up. We mostly hear these days about kicking someone's ass, especially online in forums like Facebook, and we don't see very much Wuta. So who wants to start this off? Oh, Byron, you being that you're in China and this is a hot topic for debate right now, maybe you should start it off. Well, I think uh, you've given a good introduction there. I think I'd like to add to those aspects of Wuda the uh, two other aspects which I think are very important. That One is integrity and the other one is honesty. And I think these two 
of course, they might be related, but they're also very important to uh, what Wuda and the basic principle of Wuda is. Yes. And I'd also like to say that um, while you've said that most martial arts have uh, a, a code of morality, which is basically what Wuda is, this is true, but it's not really anything unique to Chinese martial arts or even Asian martial arts. Um, if we look back in uh, the medieval days in, in Europe, there was a, a code of chivalry, and it's very similar to some of the ancient Greek concepts of, of ethos and, and, and things uh, of the like there too. So I think it's not something that is uniquely instilled in in Chinese martial arts or martial art practice, but was something that through uh, interaction of human beings and, of course, uh, through conflict and conflict resolution and then living in societies was something that naturally would have emerged in one form or another. And while they might have different uh, external appearances, I think uh, the meat and bones of all these different areas and times and uh, uh, people's philosophies on these aspects would have had very similar aspects, very similar structure, very very similar makeup. Indeed, and uh, adding on top of what Byron just said, um, he mentioned honesty, and oftentimes we only look at one aspect of honesty, but there is honesty towards other people, and there is self-honesty. And it's easier to be honest and sincere with other people than it is with yourself. Oftentimes people think they have honesty because they might tell people the truth, but they fear telling themselves the truth, and that can be a huge problem, as we have seen recently with a certain challenge match that we're going to discuss soon. Um, <laughs> so in terms of martial arts training, yes, in terms of society, you have to be honest to other people, but self-honesty is crucial for the success, for your personal success in the martial arts, because... This is what leads you forward. Most of the work is not done by your teacher. And most of the work you have to do on your own through introspection and working on your own. Even boxers and MMA fighters, most of the work and training they do, if we sum it all up, if we include the cardio work and the heavy bag and the lighter bags and the double end bag, and the speed bag and the jump the rope jumping and working with tossing dummies etc 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 and the weightlifting and all of that then you see that every most martial artists would do most of the work on their own most of the training and during all the time on your own if you don't have self honesty then that seriously hinders your progress especially if you don't have self honesty with regard to whether your technique is going to work, each and every technique that you learn and know and teach. So this is very important. Yeah, I think also you've said something, which is what I was, why I suggested the, well, why I said the two aspects of honesty and integrity is because you've rightfully noticed that in more modern times, people's uh, ethical values have uh, declined in the martial field. And you likened it to what happened in in religion or formalized religion. Um, I would say that that's quite a quite an astute observation, and the reason is that there is a common denominator in both of those, um, and that would be touching money. I think yeah. the second that things started to become linked with money, um, and this is when martial arts started to become an occupation and a business and religion became formalized, institutionalized, and then again became about uh, wealth, uh, power, etc. Uh, things change and people change because uh, now the goal is different. Now the goal uh, for a martial artist is to ensure that his cash flow is, uh, is secured. And cash flow would be based on people's perception of you. So at times, um, they would do things or say things to maintain a certain public image or a certain status in order to either attract students or maintain students. And this is when things like these uh, values of, uh, and ethical values of martial artists go. You'll see the, the, the flame wars online 
of course, online is a whole other aspect we'll talk about, but uh, that's that's a, another a whole dimension to this whole problem and conundrum we have today with people without any ethics. But when money comes into play, then and schools come into play, competition comes into play. And this competition is different to the competition we had when martial arts were, let's say, 100, 150 years ago. Uh, the, the competition back then was uh, literally competition, if it happened, was between an opponent and yourself, and your skill had to do the talking there, whereas today it's your advertising that can do the talking. Your skill might factor in 15th on that list. Yes, so um, being that Byron raised the issue of money and finance getting into the martial arts, uh, this has to do with Wuda uh, from another point of view, that people have turned what was essentially a very personal manner and method of teaching of the teacher and the apprentice. This is the traditional method of teaching worldwide since humanity existed. This is how you transmit true knowledge from one generation to another. This has mostly been turned into a business transaction between the teacher and the student. So now, instead of the wuda, the code of conduct between teacher and student and teacher to other people and student to other people, people got something else. They got a contract. Now, it's actually became quite common in the Western world to have contracts. Students sign contracts when they sign up, sign up, right? Sign up for schools. And then uh, they feel and think that they are not bound by this uh, ambiguous morality, but rather they just are bound by only what's written on paper. And the contract doesn't have to be written on paper. Oftentimes, there is a sort of business contract between teacher and student and it's not written but it's still understood so the the legal contract replaces wuda in modern times in many schools and this is a major well, problem well i wouldn't say it's a legal contract though that's the problem here i think the problem here is that the student sees it as a transaction yes he's yes. purchasing something now he's a customer and you know customer is king well, at least that's the modern understanding of it. So already the basic value and principle upon which respect between a teacher and a student should be, as it was in the past, is now something based on on, uh, on a financial transaction of him being a customer. It, in fact, turns the relationship upside down, whereas the past, the student would respect the teacher because he is getting something out of him, out of the value of this teacher's will to teach him. Now it becomes a business transaction, and he's paid for it, and therefore he's he's uh, he's what's the word I'm looking for? He's uh, he feels like well I paid, so therefore I've got to get this. It's not, and the teacher feels the same way. Like I've got to I've got to keep this customer, I've got to keep this money, and so the one actually the master that becomes through this transaction is now the money and the student, not the teacher. So it already starts to skew and shadow and change the original relationship and the way it should have been set up in, in the past because of money. And, and that doesn't mean that, uh, I'm not saying that any situation where a school teaches and charges money, this is the case, but I'm saying that it does happen and this is a, a perception that, that happens. There are teachers that run their schools and still instill a very high level of uh, ethical uh, values in their students and vice versa. But this is again why I say honesty and integrity comes into play here because a, a teacher would then be a little bit more selective on students that he'd like to keep there. And those that display negative traits, irrespective of them paying however much money, would either not continue tuition at that school because the teacher wouldn't want them there. Um, and this is this is this can happen. I mean, this is um, that's what happens with a lot of good teachers. Uh, they, they are very selective with who they they choose to keep as students. Then you've got the other side of the coin, which is a teacher who's just trying to get as much money from as many people as possible. So it's a very undesirable situation. And you see this play out a little bit when now you have some top Chinese masters asking other people to be their disciples. When in the old days, the student had to pursue the teacher. But there is some empire building. And so money is a key part of that, money and the tentacles of the organization spreading throughout the world. Now, speak, I don't know if that 
I think oh, that, that is not necessarily in itself a lack of wuda, but it's a change in the relationships. Yeah, so yes, sometimes the, the, the problem is actually promoted by the teachers themselves in their greed of money. But um, speaking of self-honesty from our perspective as teachers, we talk about wuda, but sometimes in my experience as a teacher, when you teach especially Westerners, but also uh, Chinese people in modern times, many of whom are very much influenced by Western culture and especially American culture, you wish to ex expect of them that they would understand Wuda. But Wuda in all cultures and everywhere in the world is based on traditional uh, traditions. And if they lack the, these cultural values, cultural traditions, then they would not automatically understand it. So even though the traditional framework has the teacher, uh, has the student coming asking, of, asking knowledge from the teacher, still us as teachers in modern times, we have to make a bit more of an effort to meet the students halfway, at least in terms of allowing them to learn what Wuda is and other traditional values and ideas because otherwise most of them would not get to it and then they might end up doing things which we might consider inappropriate but then again if we did not teach them that they're they shouldn't be doing these things then sometimes the line is blurred between what they ought to know by just being a decent human being and what tradition dictates that they ought to behave like yeah I yeah i could of... agree i mean i just uh... I was going to say, I believe one of the best ways to teach your students, Wuda, is to lead by example. Let them observe you living this behavior in your dealings with everybody and the way you talk about people you see as competitors or the school down the street. Lead by example, because even though we don't realize it, we're often powerful role models in students' lives. Yes, that's true. I agree with that. Um, yes, and again, what I was saying again with regards to honesty is, uh, you know, this is this is a very very good example because you mentioned the, the school down the street. While one might think that the correct way to display martial ethics is not to say anything negative about any other school, I believe and personally, my understanding and, and the way I live is to speak the truth. Uh, in every situation, and that's why I say truthfulness and integrity is very is a, is a key tenet and a core tenet of ethics. While there is a nice way to put forward the truth, that would also be in line with Wuda, how you say something. But I would also not be so quick to say that it's a, it's a situation where you should never speak the truth if it's negative. I would say, well, you should speak the truth even if it's negative, but you could present it in a mature and ethical and uh, probably a middle road way. Um, so, yeah, if there's a school down the road and the guy's a charlatan or he's a fraud or he's saying he's teaching something that he's not really, that he doesn't really have or he's teaching it incorrectly, I mean, uh, that that's also a whole other kettle of fish, but I think you it's your duty to let people know about this. and. You know, this is uh, this is what's happened in most more modern times because of uh, advertising and the ability that everybody can put up a website and make any claim they want to. That this happens more than often. And I'm not saying that that you should go out and say, "Hey, this guy's a moron," because that's exactly what I mean by saying things in the right way. But state facts, you know, and 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 have, have people think logically and clearly about the information that you present them. And if it's a fact, it doesn't matter. Who states the fact? It should hit home. You know, the first teacher I had, he claimed to be a Shaolin master who learned 900 forms as a child and was a grandmaster by the time he was in his 20s. And back then, in the 60s and early 70s, we had no clue. There was no internet. Uh, it was all mysterious to us. But it was years later when the rumors started spreading, and I realized what a fraud he actually was and how bad his arts were. And so I look back at that with very mixed feelings. I think he's, I consider him a con art, uh, artist on one hand, and yet that's how I got into the martial arts. Well, isn't so it? There, there is some good and bad here, but I don't flame him, but I'm 
honest when I say he is not truthful about his background. And as a result of that, I have very little respect for him. Yeah, well, isn't it a tragedy that oftentimes the people with the worst martial arts are best at marketing and advertising, isn't it? Yeah, and back then all you had to be was Asian and do karate or kung fu, and people would look at you as a master, and, and a lot of people still do that. Well, here's the tragedy for me, and while you say there's a plus side and a bad side, maybe in your situation there was uh, some positive, but you know, there's, let, let me ask you a question before I carry on. What made you interested to go look for a school of martial arts in the first place? Was it this guy or was it something else? Oh, it was uh, the combination of the Kung Fu TV show and the Bruce Lee movies. And that was 1973. And he was the big teacher in the area, a legend. All right. So it was actually those other things that piqued your interest in, into getting into martial arts. It wasn't necessarily this guy. And had somebody else been available or had you known better, you probably would not have gone to the school. So for me, why I say it's important to inform people if you know that somebody is uh, genuinely misleading people, why it's your duty as a martial artist to speak up about this is because people that don't know any better, like yourself in the beginning, will go there. And, and they will spend a few years uh, training with their mind, their body, their heart, their soul, uh, giving every bit of effort in their entire existence to train because they really think that they're doing something that's true and correct and eventually they'll find out the truth and when they find out the truth there's tragedy in that either they've lost their best years with this person or they become so despondent and disheartened about the whole thing that they quit martial arts in total and i've seen this happen to people i know and that's the real tragedy here, because this guy hasn't lost anything. He's made that money off the student of those years. But the student has lost his entire life in the martial arts, and that's where the real tragedy is for me. And that's why I say integrity and honesty are very important, both when we evaluate and talk about other martial artists, but also as a martial artist yourself. This is very well said by Ron. I completely agree. I've written about this in my book, Research of Martial Arts, and I call this the crime of creating ignorance. And this is indeed a crime, as you had portrayed it, because it's taken away people's lives. It's taken years from their lives, sometimes as, as much as decades. And, and money. And money, yeah. And you said something else which is very important to note. You were talking about people who are genuinely misleading their students. Now, sometimes it's difficult to judge whether a person is a charlatan or whether he's just ignorant of what he himself is doing. Because you got this these charlatans that we're speaking about, then they would teach a generation of people who would become teachers themselves. Sometimes these people who whom they've taught they don't know they're teaching bullshit. They kind of know, but maybe they suppress it. And maybe at other times you get someone who, if, if we take our, our martial art that Byron and I practice and teach, Shin Yichun. In Shin Yichun, you got quite a lot of people who don't really get the goods, but they're not terrible martial artists, and they're not charlatans. They got good martial arts going, not necessarily very traditional Shin Yichun, but they're somewhere in the middle. So one has to be careful to sort out who are the true charlatans, uh, the magicians, the people who really teach bullshit and try to make a profit out of it, and who are those people who might not be the best of teachers or the best of martial artists, or perhaps do not teach a style of martial arts as traditionally intended, but it doesn't make them bad people and they're not conning anyone and they have no bad intentions and it's important that we as martial arts teachers do not go against these people who are somewhere in the middle who are not ill intended well yes of course but um that's a kind of a separate that's kind of a different story because 
there's different levels of people even within your own within your own martial family i've got martial brothers that train with me that uh, are not very skilled you know but they like training and they continue to train and that's fine um, but again it's about honesty and uh, they don't present themselves as anything but that uh, and an average and a mediocre teacher or somebody who's not as highly skilled as somebody else, but he's, he's genuinely presenting something that's genuine, generally correct, and he's doing his best and he's being honest. It's all about the way this person is presenting himself and the way he's uh, uh, advertising and the way he's uh, interacting with, with, with people or with the martial arts community as a whole. Uh, I don't think there's any need to say, oh, he's, he's very average or he's very mediocre. That's not what I'm saying. Uh, of course, you should commend people that are doing their best and they and their their level be what it may. But I'm talking about people that have the incorrect attitude or are presenting or advertising something that is not true and not correct. Not somebody who's just of a lower level than what you expect, because we're all trying to get to a better level. And there's always going to be somebody better than me. There's always going to be somebody better than you. And there's always going to be somebody worse than me. So, you know, I, I, I'm not really talking about that, that kind of a situation. Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, and I fully support what all of you, what you've said. Um, let's take perhaps an example that's uh, very dear to my heart, which is sort of in that gray area. Uh, this is the practice of Zhanzhuang. So Zhanzhuang are a key, for, for those of the listeners who might not be familiar, a key training method in the internally oriented martial arts. It, they exist in Xingyi and in Taiji and in Bagua and other internal arts. And these are postures you hold quote-unquote statically, but they're not really static because once you pass the, the so-called static stage and you just stand there, which should not take more than a month or two or three, then there is a lot of internal movement going on. You use what's called yi, or intention, which are forms of guided imageries to control the insides of your body and the way you move your muscles in a very unique manner. And you create movement on the inside, could be the movement of your dantian, it could be a manner of tricking the muscles to feel resistance in various directions, can be in all directions at once, and could be to feel as if you are working a certain technique against a person while you're just standing there and moving your energy about. And there are quite a few methods contained within this big practice called Zhanzhuang. And perhaps the most common type of Zhanzhuang is called Hunyuanzhuang or Changbao Zhuang which is uh, what most people know as the tree-holding or tree-hugging posture, or some, some people call it the universal posture in English. And this uh, came down probably from Xing Yi Chuan, which brought it down from older Taoist traditions. And nowadays, it had been adopted by countless martial arts. So I here in Israel, you see people who are just doing medical qigong, who had never trained in Xing Yi or Yichuan or any of the internal arts, teaching Hunyuanzhuang. Or you would see people uh, practicing arts as different to Xing Yi as Lama Pai or Pak Hok Pai, uh, which is quite dissimilar to Xing Yi Chuan and the other internal arts. And they would teach Hunyuanzhuang. Why? Because they see it as a good thing to train. All right. But... Most people, what they do is they just tell their students to stand there with their, with their hands up in the air. They don't give them any corrections, which is the basics. I mean, before you even get to using your yi to learn how to use these guided images to move the body about from the inside, you have to learn proper alignment, which includes straightening your spine like a pearl necklace, relaxing your qua going down to a reasonable height, uh, you have to stand a bit low, you can't stand as if you're walking on the street, you have to align your fingers correctly, the hoko, the tiger's mouth, which is the gap between the index finger and your thumb should be rounded, all sorts of emphasis like this are put to practice and you have to make all these alignments work with each other at the same time before you can work the internal stuff. Most teachers I see who teach that method do not even teach these basic alignments, which are prerequisites for the internal training. 
So what do you make of this when you see many teachers worldwide from many different styles? They teach this method, you know the correct method because it may have come from your martial art or you have learned it from a person who knows and then you see these groups of 10, 20, 50, 100 people just standing there with their hands in the air and you know what, I had a student come to me recently from Switzerland uh, to study with me here in Israel and that person had spent a considerable amount of time, over two years, just standing there with his hands in the air with just slight breathing pointers but that's it, he wasn't given anything else and that person ba essentially wasted two years of his life. So this is one of these scenarios which Byron had described, which can uh, take away years from people's lives, years and a lot of money too. Well, I, I see it in a slightly different way. Um, I've been kind of vocal, and I, I'm sure you guys have heard me say this online or in discussion before. I know the, the name of the podcast is Internal Fighting Arts, but for me, I don't like this term, internal. And I, I don't think that there, personally, I don't think that there is a difference between high level of any martial arts and a high level of internal martial arts. They all, once you get to a high level, they all reach the same point. And all of them have factors that are, would be considered or classified internal factors, and all of them have ex external factors. So I'm not a fan of this classification. But it's indeed because of this classification of internal that happened in more recent times. I don't want to get into the history of that, but I'm sure you guys know it. It's not an old term. It's a more modernly modern time created term. But it's because of this fact that there is this, dis this distinction between internal and external and there is unfortunately a, uh, and there always was, but it wasn't as intense in the past as it is now, there is a bias that internal is superior to external, that people, whether they understand the methods of practice of arts like Xingyi or Bagua, which are classified as internal, but again, it doesn't do that, it's because they don't understand those styles and those methods that they try to grab onto something that would be considered an internal practice, uh, and that would be Hun Yuan Zhang being the, the simplest version of it, without understanding it, to throw it into their practice, because we've got this stigma attached to what is internal. And this, again, is a problem with, with uh, the environment of martial arts today. But that being said, Hun Yuan Zhang, for us, uh, we don't even practice it that much. We practice Sun Tisha as our as our our Dan Zhuang uh, method uh, and a couple of other moving Zhuang. Huan Yuan Zhuang will teach probably somebody in his very beginning uh, of training when he's uh, not done any training before. And it's a method that we use for a couple of reasons. It's one, just to calm the person so he actually can start uh, paying attention to his breathing, which most people that don't do any martial arts are unable to do easily, especially if you have to confuse them with movements and thinking about movements. Secondly, to start feeling a bit of their structure. And thirdly, to start building a bit of leg strength that they're going to need to develop a lot deeper as they start practicing the uh, Santi Shur, etc. Santi Shur is a method of Jan Zhuang that develops a unique structure that we use in, in Xing Yi Chuan. So our Huan Yuan practice is simply a basic beginning step, and uh, that's fine. I, I also think that other martial arts, if they're teaching it, that's fine. I don't see anything wrong with it. I think that it might actually help them a little bit to get a little bit centered before they start practicing or or to start, uh, start thinking about aspects like breathing. That's also fine. I would think that if somebody is doing a style, for example, that I don't know some um, let's say, for example, a Filipino style that has its own principles. Uh, this is just an example, by the way. Uh, and then they were teaching them sun t-shirt. Then I'd say, well, this guy is now a little bit confused. But when you and Zhang is a little bit of a gray area. Yeah, I, I teach it for all the reasons that you described. I was interviewing someone on the podcast last year and I uh, mentioned doing standing and, uh, and how at, at a certain point you can begin to even move the Dantian while you're doing standing. And he just corrected me and said, no, 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 you can't do that. You can't. And I thought, well, okay, that's, that's one opinion. <laughs> uh, everybody has them. Yeah, yeah, that's, I mean, that's valid too. And that's why I say with Wen Yuan Zhuang, uh, it's, it's, again, 
it's something that's a little bit that could could overlap with many many different uh, practitioners practitioners and styles and give them some form of benefit. Um, talking about specifics like uh, like the moving of the dantian and things like that. I mean, we could start talking about our unique practices in in Xingyi with uh, Santi Shi and then our other Zhuang methods because we have a lot of Zhuang methods. But I think in the in the last the last podcast I was on, I kind of explained that a lot of them are moving. Uh, and that's when you start to to move the the center, the dantian, and the whole body as a unit. But this is not what this podcast is about. So. <laughs> yeah, sure. You know, and of, I also want to uh, drop just a, a small note. Um, Byron and I actually do not disagree about Honyan Zhuang. Uh, uh, people who might not practice Zhang Zhuang uh, might not realize this, but Zhang Zhuang methods they are shared through the stances, meaning you could use the same methods, most of the methods contained within Hunyuan Zhuang, you can use in San, inside Santi Shu. Most of the stuff inside of Santi Shu, you can use in Hunyuan Zhuang in other postures. The sure. posture is specific because it has specific purposes. For instance, in Xi, Santi Shu is a combative posture, and it's, very, it's key for the combative aspects of the art. Uh, and Hunyuan Zhuang is more health oriented for various reasons. So um, in my Xing Yi, we keep using Hunyuan Zhuang. We train it a bit more, even when you get more skilled, because it has its benefits. But I also can see where Byron is coming from, and what he says also has value, because what you get from Hunyuan Zhuang, you can also put in your Santi Shu, so you don't have to practice it all the time. Good point. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I, if you if you'll just allow me to go back to something Byron said earlier. I want to quote Shifu Chen Zhonghua. Just a thing he said, which I'm summarizing here about the traditional teaching method. Byron mentioned the need to kick out students who are problematic, who do not follow proper wuda. And uh, Chen Zhonghua says, in the traditional Chinese method of teaching, one would not allow students to exercise vigilantism. His teacher, Chen Zhonghua's teacher, the late Hong Junchang, kicked out three disciples for displaying such behavior the, of vigilantism. The Chinese traditional teacher only wants to give the goods to ethical people because if the student is unethical, he can not only hurt other people, but also eventually hurt the teacher too. Interesting. I've only had to kick one person out of my classes in uh, 20 years. I started teaching 20 years ago this fall. And a young man came in who was arrogant and really tried to uh, do a lot of head hunting and was rude to me. And I pulled him aside one day and I said, either you have respect for yourself, for this art, and for your teacher, or don't come back. And he kind of laughed and he hung around that day, but he didn't come back. And now he's in prison after pulling together one of the largest drug rings that has ever operated in this area. So it's a very interesting how people like that, you, they do show themselves. Yes. Yeah, generally karma has a way of coming back to you. Um, so, yeah, uh, that's very, very uh, valid. Uh, regarding the, the quote by Chen Zhong, Zhonghua, uh, I, I think it's also um, valid to understand the political climate that his teacher was living in um, when he would be, he would be definitely not only his political climate, but also he himself and his experiences, which you guys and the listeners of the podcast may do their own research into what happened to him. But um, he would be even more careful with having a student that could possibly go out and be vigilantism. Okay, okay. I mean, in general, we all understand what that means, but it could be somebody trying to even do the right thing and end up as a side effect doing something incorrect or hurting somebody that he shouldn't have hurt. And uh, this would, with the political climate that was in China and the political background uh, of the situation of, the, of that teacher, would have definitely landed that teacher in really hot water. So there is a little bit of that. Um, yeah, but Byron, when we talk just, about just vigilante... A, just a moment. Yeah. I think for the benefit of the listeners who are not familiar with Chinese, recent Chinese history, and the political climate in China during the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution, 
and who Chen Zhonghua's teacher was, uh, his name, uh, as we mentioned earlier, is Hong Junsheng. Uh, perhaps you can expand a little bit on that. I'm I'm not gonna talk about another person's uh, teacher's history. I mean, you know, you know Chen Zhonghua personally, and I don't. So uh, it would be better that you explain it. I'm not in a position to shed light on his on his background, especially with regards to that political uh, situation. Oh, all right. I, I'm not sure we're talking about the same thing, but in any event, the listeners should be aware that during the communist hardcore rule of China. Now, the Communist Party is still con in control of China, but and nowadays it's perhaps, a, I don't know if we can call it a semi-dictatorship, but it's not as bad as it was in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s. And back in the day, in those decades when Hong Junsheng, uh, Chen Zhonghua's teacher, was teaching, a lot of martial arts teachers could get in serious trouble, and by serious trouble I mean imprisonment, death sentence, uh, public beatings, etc. Really nasty stuff if they or their students were interpreted to do something which went against the values of the Communist Party, uh, so-called against the values of the people. And this did not merely pertain to them. Uh, this was relevant for everyone living in China at the time. You would, you would have preferred to keep low-key in general. So I assume that uh, what Byron means is that they did not want to draw attention to unnecessary violence or training people how to fight and things like that because the government would not like this happening and they would take action against it. Yes, I was I was referring to that. But there was also, I mean, if, if, okay, I'm not going to, I'm not going to get into Hong Junshin's uh, personal I wanted to add something with regards to that vigilantism, because if you look back at, di at different times in Chinese history and the public understanding of what a hero was, you would see that actually a lot of heroes were actually vigilantes. So um, in this regard, it was people that would stand up for the weak or beat the guy who's a thief, and I mean to the point of kill the guy who's a thief, and you'd still be called a hero. My own lineage of Bagua, which comes from uh, Liang Chinpu, uh, you know, there's stories of him uh, beating some thieves with a with a nine section or whip and killing them. So, you know, he wasn't a policeman, but uh, that could be considered vigilantism. But he's regarded as a hero for that. So, you know, it's there's a lot to it. It's a, quite a complicated uh, definition to try try draw a line on. Would you say that in traditional Chinese culture and perhaps uh, even today, um, ch the Chinese people, Chinese students are more inclined than Western students to exercise vigilantism with their martial arts because of that cultural background and because of famous novels like On the Water Margin, etc.? You mean in today's, today's environment, in today's world? Yes. No, I don't think they would today. Not not mainland Chinese people in, in that regard. In general, the the community here has a very it's not my business, it's not my problem uh, mentality, which is, uh, it was actually a survival tool for uh, all the stuff that's happened uh, in the past that we mentioned slightly. So, no, I, in nowadays time, people are very reluctant to get involved with anything that does does not affect them. I'd like to ask you both, Byron, you're in Beijing, Jonathan, you're in Israel. What do you see in those countries in martial artists as far as training in Wuda? Are they being taught? Are there tra traditions there where they are still being taught or is it changing? Well, uh, as we had stated earlier, Wuda is um, culture dependent, right? So in Israel, you'd see different schools interpreting the concept of Wuda very differently. So, for instance, I just opened the website of a very famous Israeli organization. It's called Dennis Survival. It's a funny name, <clears throat> Dennis Survival, but it's it was created by this guy, Dennis Hanover, since uh, decades ago. He's perhaps the most famous martial artist in Israel. Uh, he's got a lot of schools under him, lots of branches, and this is a, basically a form of Israeli Krav Maga, but it's not called Krav Maga, it's a Denny Survival, a very famous system here, 
we're talking about thousands of practitioners in Israel and worldwide, still not well known outside of Israel, relatively speaking. And on the website, you see their uh, wood version of wood. And it is by this order. Respect for God. Respect for the flag. Respect for the family. Respect for the teacher. Respect for friends. And respect for yourself. Which is a v very interesting because I, I would flip the order completely. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so... First of all, you gotta have self-respect because if you don't have self-respect, how are you how are you gonna have, be able to respect anything else? And but in any case, this just gives you um gives you guys a glimpse of the cultural mindset in a very very different geographic location on the globe. So if you were to teach your Buddha in an American school or even a Chinese school, and you'd have an article on your Wuda document saying respect to the flag. This might be interpreted by, by some as um, like fascism or, or some form of extreme patriotism. Not that it's bad to respect uh, the flag of one's country, but what does this have to do with a martial arts school? But perhaps in the mindset of many Israelis, with the name of the system itself being Dennis Survival. It's about his survival, you know, this guy, Dennis Hanover, since he came from, I think, South Africa. He had to survive many fights with people who wanted to badly injure or even kill him because he was a Jew. And he came here and he was of the generation that built up the country after the Holocaust. And his system is in many ways about the Jewish survival. Survival of the Jewish people and teaching them how to face violence so they wouldn't have to go like lambs to the slaughter again as most did unfortunately in the holocaust so for this kind of martial arts school things like respect for god respect for the flag that's part of their ethos of national survival but this has perhaps nothing to do with teaching martial arts elsewhere in the on the planet and once more you got these schools from Denny Survival or the Krav Maga organizations. They would emphasize more the, that aspect of nationalism or militarism. Oftentimes because many of the people who teach at these schools were former infantrymen, army officers, people with army careers, people who taught Krav Maga or were taught Krav Maga in the army. So the army is very close and dear to their hearts. So they have a sort of um, boot camp-like discipline and fitness regime in their school. The way they warm up their students, like what they're used to doing in boot camp. Okay, so these are the, the Israeli systems, most of them. And then you got a lot of other things, you know. You got the traditional Chinese martial arts. I teach them very traditionally as I was taught in Israel by my Shifu Nitsan Oren who studied them for many years in China as an, and as I was taught in China by late master Zhou Jingxuan. However, uh, there are many people in Israel who teach the traditional Chinese or Japanese martial arts who make a sort of mix or compromise between the traditional methods and that Israeli mindset. So they would have this boot camp like warm up on the order and mentality but then they also got the tra more traditional aspects alongside that. So it's a very unique and eclectic and multicultural environment where people bring a lot of things together, which um, it is in many ways what Israeli culture is about. The Israelis are well known for being innovative by just bringing lots of things together and creating something new. So this is a prominent theme in the martial arts community here in Israel. Yeah, I think here that uh, I do see a lot of schools with American flags up as well. And some schools even do the pledge at the beginning of class, which takes Wuda in a whole different direction. I don't know that they <laughs> intend that, but uh, it does. You know, I think that's quite interesting, though, um, because it is quite a, a complicated topic. Uh, there's a fine line between uh, having respect for your country and being overtly, aggressively nationalistic. But I think that's where this basic tenets of Wuda are, are 
and any ethical philosophical uh, thought would clear this up very easily for you because it's one thing to respect your country it's another thing to support and be overtly patriotic that you are willing to harm others without justification for your country for in support of your country so I don't see anything wrong with saying, telling somebody you should respect your country, and uh, that's fine. But you should also teach them to respect fellow human beings. And there should be a system in your head that is able to determine when one should trump the other. Uh, this is, if we're talking about ethics, uh, it's not just a black and white issue, but you should be able to look at what's presented in front of you in a situation think about it, understand it clearly, and act in the appropriate way or think in the appropriate way. So, yeah, you can see that there's a lot of uh, nationalism happening in many countries worldwide. Uh, it's, uh, it seems to be in the last two years that uh, nationalistic mentality has, has been somewhat spreading in many countries. And in China, it's been actually, uh, it has been the same. Uh, so, I find it difficult to support any mentality where you want to say your country is above another country or that you should support your country and do harm to some other people simply in support of your country. I, uh, for me, that's where, that's where you should have an ethical and uh, philosophical understanding of how to differentiate between uh, these, these issues. So you asked in China if the methods of Wuda are being taught in terms of uh, martial arts here. China is in a very interesting situation, and I'm going to speak frankly, because um, in the last, well, this generation uh, and uh, the one before, China had gone through so many changes that people's method of living and uh, raising kids has also changed. A lot of the traditional cultural values and methods and ideologies were gone, and a lot of the reliance on everything, including the way you think, had to come down from the government. The people were reliant on the government to tell them how to think. So in that regard, there is a very, and I can't say it's for everyone, but it is a large, a large portion of people. They were raised in a way that they weren't initially taught basic, what we would understand as values at home and, and ethical, uh, moral understanding at home. They generally go to school and they think they're going to start learning that when they go to school. So it's, and also with the sudden rise of China as in financial, economical, you know, as it's, its place in the world, political, etc. And the people's lifestyles have changed from one generation to another. With the one child policy where people are being spoiled and treated like little princes from the day they're born, because there's only one child, four grandparents, you know, I mean, four grandparents, two parents, and one child. This guy's a prince, you know. Um, so they often get spoiled and they get raised without having their uh, attitudes checked and, and things like that. So when they – we don't deal with a lot of this with my teacher because some of you will know what my teacher is. He's a traditional folk teacher. He doesn't have a school that he rents. He doesn't make flyers. He, he – he teaches because you get an introduction through somebody who knows him, and I'll take you through there, and you can meet him. And then we go to his house, and we – well, his apartment, his complex, so we train outside in a courtyard. Whether it's freezing or boiling, we're outside training there. So his way of teaching is not formalized. There's no institution. But he has a very formalized way of teaching you. And not everybody lasts through that. But I have seen the odd person come through of a younger generation – with what I would be considering as a disrespectful attitude or a lack of Buddha. It would be considered a lack of Buddha, but uh, at times, like Jonathan said earlier, they don't know they're doing this. So it takes a bit of time for them to learn the proper etiquettes. Because there's one thing to understand the etiquette and the methods that you have to interact, and that is largely cultural. And there's another thing when we talk about ethical thinking and respect in that way. And that, I believe, you should get from home first, and it can be built on through martial arts. So uh, sometimes they don't have the understanding of the etiquette, and that they can learn as long as they have the correct mental intention and heart. If they haven't got that basic ethical understanding, the etiquette, they will never learn. Uh, but generally, I've seen that those people disappear.
And uh, given that we've now uh, been discussing the, the clash between past and present and traditional culture and modern culture, perhaps we can begin to discuss that um, big event that's been uh, on the internet just everywhere over the past week. Uh, Byron, do you want to get to that? Are you talking about well, the I mean, MMA fight? Yes, yes. M- fight and MMA. You... Could we... <laughs> Could we touch on this one or two more issues here? Sure, sure. Before we I think that's that. exactly what I was going to suggest. I was going to suggest, let's ask you, Ken, what else you wanted to get through first before we move on. Well, for one thing, the, the discussion we've had the last few minutes has brought back some memories of a teacher I respected and spent a lot of time and money and blood, sweat, and tears practicing with. And things would puzzle me about behavior. For example, my teacher smoking during an acupuncture class, <laughs> calling Chinese chinks during class. And you sometimes swallow these things when you're a student thinking, I put in a lot of time here. I've made a big investment here. But as I have gotten older, I've developed a lot lower tolerance for behavior like that in, by martial artists. And sometimes I see things expressed in a very negative way online about other people, immigrants, others. It's politics, and yet sometimes it strikes me as a complete lack of wuda uh, for this person to express views in the mean-spirited way that they do. Yeah. Online is a particular problem, but it seems there are beliefs and behaviors, especially now in this divided era, that violate wuda if you even hold them. Am I wrong? No, I think I think you you're quite right. But uh, you actually raised something that we wanted to discuss and touch on, and that was the whole internet uh, phenomena and how people interact with each other online. And the, in in martial arts, we have this too. And there's there's two reasons. There's a there's a double fold reason for why people are so brash and openly will insult one another, even online or even sometimes like. A, in an article or whatever and online is a reason is because they have the the security of uh, dehumanizing the interaction with another person because in general if you're sitting with somebody in front of you you would wouldn't dare interact with them in that way yeah and this again this again goes back to the basic core tenets of why we have manners with other human beings and I don't want to sound like a simpleton but the basic tenet upon which manners were built on is that you're going to get beaten up if you are uh, don't have manners. That's how it was. Because if you don't have manners, let's say, for example, uh, pushing and shoving, that's just one very good example. If you went back 200 years ago and you were pushing and shoving your way through somebody, somebody who's bigger and stronger than you will push and shove his way in front of you and possibly you know, get rid of you in, in, in a more physical method uh, than, than just simply pushing and shoving. So manners and uh, etiquette was a method that society used to put everybody on a level playing field, whether you're physically strong or completely weak. We all have a certain protocol that we can all have a chance at living together, in a civilized way, and everyone has a chance at whatever they're trying to do. So uh, those type of manners are based on the possible repercussions of your interaction with other human beings. So the online phenomenon that you've been talking about, especially flame wars between martial artists, is simply because they know they'll never see that person face to face. So they're not worried about the repercussions. The repercussions are gone. The second part of it is that in our modern society, in the past, if you were a martial artist and you spoke rudely or badly or something about another martial artist, there's a good chance that he would come through to you and uh, you would uh, settle this in a, in a more physical way. Nowadays with laws, all you've got to do is uh, press charges or get a restraining order. And you can still continue your method of interacting in an unethical or impolite way and uh, nothing's going to happen to you. you in fact be protected. So there is that. And you, you were just mentioning somebody who's you know, pretty bigoted. And I'm the kind of person that I don't mind if anybody presents his point of view to me, even if it's a bigot. Because generally, if somebody's bigoted and you sit and discuss it clearly, 
trying to get them to elaborate on their position with logic and reason and points, uh, inevitably uh, they have no logic and reason to present to you, unless they present something that is of value and then we've all learned something out of this. But uh, yeah, uh, and unfortunately there's too many people that uh, neither want to learn nor will listen, so it's difficult. So uh, given that it's so difficult nowadays to enforce manners online, shouldn't we say that it's partly our responsibility as teachers to convey a better attitude to our students because society has become so chaotic online. Yes. Yeah. And the way we conduct ourselves online. Yes, indeed. And this is also very important to remember now that uh, the students can see your presence online quite well on Facebook and uh, via other means. And every word you say, they remember. One of the reasons I started this podcast was to meet people like the two of you, a dedicated martial artists, and promote you and other teachers. And at the same time, it's a win-win. I come off as a purveyor of information, which is always a good thing. I don't do this for totally unselfish reasons, but the main purpose is to get information out to people and to promote other martial artists. At the same time, every time I do an interview and the podcast airs, I get messages telling me just how full of shit the person was that I just interviewed. And I mean, every time. And in the last two or three weeks, suddenly I was being informed by people around the world that a particular instructor, a highly skilled instructor, was bad-mouthing me and the guest I had last on the program, calling him a liar for saying things about his teacher that this other former guest didn't appreciate and telling the world that I am not only uneducated about the politics and the people of China, but also I am putting liars on my program and not counterbalancing them or not calling them out on their lies. That's what triggered this podcast this week. And this was the second time this person has come out after me in the last few weeks. He made some disparaging remarks about the Chen Village way of doing Tai Chi. And when I had someone from the Chen Village on, I asked him about that. And he said it, that was dishonorable for me to do. Which I told him, put it on your big boy pants. This is a public <laughs> forum. And if you say something in public, it becomes part of our dialogue and we discuss it. Because most of my Chen Tai Chi I do comes through the Chen Village way. So it's important to me to learn which is better, and can I improve, can other people improve. So this is very disappointing to me. The whole thing about calling other martial artists liars is problematic as far as integrity, respect, honor. And I, I do guarantee, I agree with you, they would not say the same thing to the guy's face, and yet they do it online, and it's very disappointing. I think what you're doing is the right thing with uh, opening a dialogue because I think that uh, almost every problem that a person has with another person can, in general, be resolved through dialogue. I think uh, if the dialogue doesn't happen, then the animosity just grows and grows and grows and grows. But dialogue can clear up a lot of things. I mean, you, of course, you get some very illogical and stubborn and uh, you know, people that just uh, won't even listen to reason. But those in general, in my experience, have been the minority, not the majority of people. So you're dealing with it in the right way. And people to attack you to say that uh, you're at fault for having a certain guest on, you can't pick and choose who you want to have on. I think the, the purpose of dialogue is to have everybody have their say. And it's up to the listener to use his uh, intelligence and reason to sift through this and draw his own conclusions. I mean, you're just a facilitator for discussion. You are neither supporting nor denying anybody's point of view. So I think uh, I think a lot of people, like you said, need to put their big boy pants on. And if a fact comes through that puts something in a negative light, or whether it's a fact or a statement, and you have information to the contrary, then that is what should be the focus of your uh, of your complaint, that the fact can be countered with another fact, not the person 
who said something should be attacked. And that is what generally happens. The messenger gets shot. Uh, and that's, a, that's actually a normal human, human reaction. And it's interesting, the more, you know, when you first hear about someone bad-mouthing you or calling you a liar or stupid or whatever, my immediate reaction is like a lot of people's, I want to start throwing roundhouse kicks. But then I calm down and I realize, you know, I really do respect this guy as a martial artist who said these things. I don't want bad blood. I listened to the interviews again, the podcasts he was on, and really enjoyed them. But it is something that, you know, I'm not going to tolerate it. I'm not going to entertain it. I'll block his ass if that's the way he's going to be. Uh, I have a zero tolerance for that. If someone comes on my page with the arrogance to start critiquing me, they're gone. I don't do yeah. that to other people. And uh, I don't expect to be dealt with that way. If they want to send me a private message and say, hey, you could do better on this. I will eat it up with a spoon. But well, uh, well, if somebody had, if somebody had this person, because I'm not actually up to date with uh, the, the, the war, uh, what was said. But if this person had come onto your page and said, uh, I had, uh, I have issue with this point, this point, this point, and this point, and this is why. I would have welcomed. I think it. that would have been exactly, and I think anybody would have welcomed that. But simply to say, well, you don't understand. You don't and understand. And he's a liar. You're a moron. And you're letting liars on. Yeah. <laughs> there are several more issues lurking in the background here behind this unfortunate personal incident that uh, plagued Ken in recent weeks. Um, I, I was talking about this with Ken uh, before the podcast. The thing is, when people invest many years of their lives, decades often, in a given martial art and a specific lineage of a martial art, then the whole thing becomes very, very personal to them. Because they feel they have to protect that, that sort of practice and teaching and method and lineage as if it was their own house or their own family. And many a time, they are family. They, they've gone through a discipleship, a bachelor ceremony, and the teacher is their family, and what they do is family matters. So when someone goes against your family, what do you do? You protect the family. However, oftentimes these people don't make the distinction that, as a matter of fact, people from a parallel lineage in your martial art are not really members of the same family. They are very, very, very like 10th cousin distant from you. Very, very distant from you. So you don't really need to fight them. They're, you're not even really related. You're bi maybe biologically related, but, but I, aren't we all? So this brings about silly wars between lineages. And I think, you know what? If I'm practicing a certain lineage, and I'm making a bold claim that this or that lineage is inferior, or they lack knowledge, they have issues, they're bad people, whatever. Okay, so if I'm saying all of this, why, why do I even care what they do? Why should I wage wars against them if they're so-called inferior? Let them just be, you know? It's for your own benefit. I always tell people, you need the good and the bad in the world. And you need the bad to get a sense of the good. If you only had fast food restaurants, could you ever appreciate good food? It, the same thing happens with the martial arts. You need the bad teachers, not the charlatans, not the liars, not the cheaters, not the people who con their students for decades. I'm talking about just mediocre martial artists, people who might even teach your art, but not in such a good way. Or perhaps they teach it in a good way, but not the way you think it should be taught. Okay, but if it weren't for these people, how could potential students and just onlookers say, oh, his martial arts are very good compared to, compared to what, if they didn't exist? So why are you trying to, to wipe out the diversity? You know, that diversity is crucial for human society in all aspects and walks of life and in all professions. And more so, when we, we, we or you rule out a different lineage, I mean, a lineage is not just a single lifetime, it's the lifetime of several teachers, several people. And you look at the teacher and you say, oh, so he does this thing with his knees that's really bad for his health. He doesn't know what he's doing. Or 
you know, this this guy really doesn't know how to move his dantian, right? Or some stuff like that. Oh, this guy doesn't know how to fight. Okay, that's your opinion. You might be correct. You might be wrong. But the fact of the matter is that person whom you're criticizing, this is a living human being. And he's been practicing all his life. Or maybe not all his life. Maybe just, just 10, 20, 30, 40 years. And in all of these years of practice, didn't that person have even a single good idea i'm sure that every person who's been pursuing the martial arts for decades has had not just a single good idea but many brilliant ideas and there's a thing to learn from everyone even from these people from different lineages whom you might be considering to be quote unquote inferior and if we take there is an example which um was discussed um yesterday which i saw online yesterday of a very 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 famous Tai Chi Chuan teacher, a very famous person, does seminars worldwide. I won't mention his name, and he did this uh, thing on TV where he was pitted supposedly against a strong man, and the strong man couldn't move him. And some, you know, a lot of people, and you know who I'm talking about, yes. and. And a lot of people went after the man because this is a magic trick for the cameras. Obviously, you got this strong man who weighs three times as much as him. He's probably ten times stronger. He's like maybe 30 years younger or more. And then this guy who's a lot older, much more frail. I mean, there's no way the strong man would have crushed him like the mountain in Game of Thrones crushed that guy. Not doing any spoilers here. So in any case... This guy does this magic trick on TV for fame and for money. Okay, bad, bad, bad. Bad person being criticized for that. But does it really mean that person who did the magic trick, does he have, he might be, have been a charlatan with this one particular trick on TV, or maybe he does some other um, things which other people don't like. Does it mean that he doesn't have skill? Does it mean that in decades of practice, uh, he didn't get really, really good? It does different some things differently from your lineage. So does it really out as a martial artist or as a human being? I mean, we should judge uh-huh. people in a holistic way for all of their qualities, good and bad. And that way we can learn from them. If we just rule out people based on they got the wrong transmission, they have the bad lineage, then we can't learn anything from anyone. And then if you put yourself out in public as a martial artist of a Tai Chi instructor who exhibits Wuda in your life and in your teaching. What does it say about your humility, your respect, your integrity, your self-control, and your compassion to come out and flame people online? It says you are lacking, in my opinion. And the people who follow you and who like your flames they're lacking too. And, and all of these people need to step back a little bit and I think do a little self-analyzation about just how much Wuda have they learned in reality. Well, the internet is very different from real life. This is why, uh, as Byron has suggested, if you and that uh, person who caused you trouble in recent times would have sat face to face, you might have ended up being best friends or at least on very friendly terms. But when things go on the internet, uh, the wars get I had get a great reality. time with him on the phone doing the interviews. I'd do it again. <laughs> He's very knowledgeable. I actually want to chime in on that uh, strongman thing because uh, for me, I see it a little bit differently. Uh, for me, I, I, I like to, to look at, if I can, identify a person's uh, original intent with everything that they do. But let me ask you something, Jonathan. If you saw the same person doing a demonstration where he was uh, doing a no-touch knockout on people and presenting it as real, would you accept it? Would you not lay any criticism on on that uh, public display and promotion? Even, let's say, for example, they were just actors pretending to be knocked out. Yeah, you bring a very reasonable point. I would be way harsher in my criticism. However, I think the, the thing that happened with the strongman was the teacher was aspiring, despite knowing that he couldn't, to demonstrate a Taiji principle, supposedly. Even though I cannot see how resisting force with force is Taiji principle, but let's just say that he tried to do that. So at least he was trying to show, even if he couldn't, something that's supposed to be with 
contained within his martial arts, while the no no touch knockouts are really shameful magic tricks well, to I, lure people. I would have respected it more if he tried and failed and admitted it than uh, what actually happened with that with that performance. And and then again, I want to go back to understanding the intent of such a performance and, and uh, such a promotion. If the intent is to give people the impression that Tai Chi will somehow make you into a superhuman, then I cannot agree with it in any shape or form because it's dishonest. Good point. It's dishonest. It's dishonest and it gives people unrealistic expectations of the art and the people. And we need to bring our martial arts back into reality because they are true things. They have their values outside of magic that have lasted for hundreds of years. And they can continue to last as long as people focus on those. But if we have to throw in magic and muddy the waters with all this nonsense that's been going on, and as I can honestly say it's nonsense, then we are killing the martial arts ourselves. And I don't want to stand by and watch that happen because that is not what they are. And this, again, for me, is my way of, of, of Buddha. Unfortunately, I look at people's original intent. This is um, a very good point. Another thing I want to state, though, is that person whom we're speaking about has many thousands of students in China and worldwide. Students and grand students and grand grand students and all of these people who practice his Taiji, many of them are very dedicated, good-hearted people. And he also, for instance, I know he has a very long-term representative in Europe who is a very dedicated practitioner. And if based on that uh, magic trick with a strongman, we rule out their entire art or their entire lineage, then we do a disservice to many thousands of people because the ancestor did one shameful thing, even though he did more than one shameful thing. But he might not be a decent person in some ways, but many of the things he did transmit are worthwhile. So we have to look at it not just as, is yes, he did a bad thing, this is bad for martial arts, but also there are good aspects to what he's teaching sometimes to some people. Oh, for sure. I'm not, I'm not saying that you've got to judge everything about him based on one action. But in reality, it's not us that have uh, put the situation at hand there. He did with the portrayal of this feat. So this, again, is karma coming round. Or, as they say, the chickens coming yeah. home to roost. So, you know, I, again... I'm not saying that there's no value to the person. I'm saying that type of thing is really wrong. It shouldn't be uh, praised, and it should be scorned the way, the way it is. Indeed, I started indeed. criticizing people who do um, the no-touch no touch knockdown 20 years ago, and I had the challenge in Inside Kung Fu Magazine, $5,000, do it to me. We'll have people there, and we'll give you $5,000 on the spot. And so I was putting my money where my mouth was. <laughs> and still, that, that, that offer is still standing. You mean, um, you mean I, can, I, I can knock you out without a touch and get $5,000? Yes, you can. Oh, my. I should I, go training. Actually, I, I changed it. I said, if I stand before you and you make me wobble uncontrollably, I will give you the $5,000. And I've approached several people who make these claims and haven't had that offer taken up once. Well, I know a few people with some really, really bad breath that I think <laughs> might have taken that money out of you. <laughs> so, you know, there are things that need to be criticized, especially if it's very obvious that people are being taken. But when it comes to uh, someone's skill, or maybe they were told this story by their teacher, they repeat it, and they're called liars. And, you know, there's some, I guess, some behavior that, that we have to rethink. We, we have to pay attention to the fact that this trend of uh, doing magic tricks on TV and especially on Chinese television is growing rampant uh, these past few years. And it has become quite common. I don't know if um, Westerners listening to this uh, are aware, but on Chinese television, about on a monthly basis or every few months, there would be a show where they would show certain Chinese masters 
supposedly effort, effortlessly controlling other people, usually Westerners like puppets, on uh, what's being called documentaries. And it's all being, uh, of course, staged. And these Westerners are being probably paid good money to, to act as their puppets. Otherwise, there are even um, better staged events when they have fighting competitions, uh, which are live on television sometimes. And these are staged also between uh, people from the same martial art and sometimes with people practicing Chinese traditional martial arts pitted against people from Japanese or Western martial arts. And of course, the Chinese all always end up winning or uh, maybe eight of the ten Chinese fighters would win uh, and stuff like yeah. that. You know, there's one uh, young Chen guy that I admire his fighting ability. One of the reasons I admire it so much is what he has done on some of these programs. And you watch it and you think, he never loses a point. But then you find out, and I don't know how true it is, but I've been told that some of these people he's fighting are actually his students. And it is set up. And when you yes. hear that, it's very disappointing. So this kind of draws a full circle with that initial that initial uh, strongman thing. Because let me show you the flip side of this coin. Let's say, for example, it never comes out that uh, it was a staged, uh, staged uh, performance. Then some guy gets uh, interested in Tai Chi in, in the USA. And he gets interested and he wants to practice Tai Chi because he's seen this thing. And then he comes to you here and he expects you to replicate the same feat. And then you're unable to replicate the same feat. And then what? And then is that good? He's probably not even going to stay with you. He's going to go off looking for the magic that doesn't exist forever. And this is, a, this is the key point of all these fake staged matches, fake documentaries, fake actions. It's going to damage Chinese martial arts in the wrong, long run. Because when people finally find out that it cannot be done, then all of us, all of us in Chinese martial arts lose credibility. Not just those liars, not just those people that did those uh, city performances, but the entire realm of Chinese martial arts loses credibility. Yeah, and you so, see Aikido a, a demonstrations where, oh, you mean I can't really use two fingers and sweep the sky off his feet? Right, that's exactly it's a, it. So, it's yeah. an epidemic. But you know what, what Jonathan was saying about this documentary, and, and he's right, for some reason it's gone rampant in the last two years in China, the uh, last few years, that this type of thing is becoming more and more common. And uh, there's a TV series that uh, is completely scripted and prepared, and all the feats in there are, are basically prearranged, but it's presented as if it's real. And it's, again, like you said, some foreigner getting beaten up by some master who then also performs some magical feat. And... Uh, and the entire show is about Chinese martial arts, trying to say real Chinese martial arts or real, real skill, you know, real, real skill of Chinese martial arts. And if the real skill of Chinese martial arts and people expect that, you know, it's, it's just nowhere near the truth. It's nowhere near reality. But it's that, for me, is the antithesis of Wuda right there. And the people that are involved in it, they have absolutely no Wuda. They have no ethics and they have no morality if they're doing this because they're doing a disservice to everyone. I'm sure that it feeds their egos very nicely, though, which again, you know, is something that uh, we need to be cautious of as martial artists. Don't you believe that this is one reason this is happening more is because the government has finally realized that they can make money this way by attracting fame and fortune to these Tai Chi people? I believe some of the Chen family are now millionaires. Yes, we know that, but it's for me. I, I'm going to speak frankly. I live in this environment, so it's hard for a lot of people to understand. But this is a partial, partially, not just partially. It's very much connected to uh, the nationalism that's been flaring up here. So uh, Chinese martial arts, Chinese people's art. It's a martial combat method against others. Should be able to beat them. Should be the best. Must be the best. We are the best. This is basically the train of thought that's been going into this whole this whole thing. And, you know, there is a very big problem with a lot of martial arts, Chinese martial arts practitioners today, is that, that they are disconnected from applying their art. They don't practice to apply their art. They don't try to apply their art regularly. They, a lot of them don't understand how to apply their art. But they welcome students and they teach and they teach and they teach. And 
whether they, they've got a, a, a trumped up understanding of their own ability, whether it's misguided or they're just deliberately misleading people, they're both the same thing. This is what's happening today. And, and this is why it's a, actually a problem. I mean, if you look at even a, a, a judoka, a ju- this, this all comes back to honesty. You, honesty about what you are and your ability and what you represent. You need to be honest as a martial artist. And if you've got a judoka, for example, he's not going to be dishonest about this. He's not going to come out and say, I'm going to beat every, I'm going to beat a UFC champion. Uh, you know, I mean, he knows because he regularly tests himself against other people. It's, this is one way to really hammer down your ego is to be shown how small you actually are when you're actually regularly competing with somebody or trying with somebody or applying your art with somebody. It makes them honest with themselves and they know what they can do and what they cannot do. And this, I feel, is is lacking in, in a lot of Chinese martial arts practice today. So right? what, what Byron was just uh, speaking of and then that plus the backlash to all these stage performances on Chinese television is what brings us to the most recent uh, notorious televised public event where we have a Chinese MMA coach challenging the so-called fake Taiji practitioners and teachers. He stressed, at least originally, that he's only targeting those who are fakes and he challenged them all to come and fight him and show what they got because he was sure of himself that he could win and he picked up an internet fight with some guy, some unknown, who supposedly, uh, he called himself a Taiji master, even though he had limited training in the art and was uh, engaged in doing other styles mostly. And then that uh, other guy claiming to be a Taiji master, he had fought the man, He they, there was arranged a uh, fight between them, no rules fight, and it was on, uh, it was videoed on several cameras, and it's now all over the internet, the MMA coach just completely smashed him in about 10-12 seconds. Uh, he was on the ground in maybe 6-7 seconds and then he kept punching him for the other three. And you know, this guy, this MMA coach, he was reacting partly to all of that stage bullshit going on on television and all these people making their magical claims but in the process of doing so and in waging his personal war, probably for selfish reasons, for publicity, against all these fakes and challenging them and coming up um, winning uh, wonderfully or uh, terribly, depending on how you, how you look at it, against this nobody who did not possess any substantial skill in the traditional Chinese martial arts, then you got the entire art of Taiji Chuan suffering the consequences, suffering from very bad reputation. And then it puts everyone in, in turmoil and it brings about further wars. And later, after that fight, the MMA coach went and challenged openly Chen Village. And then um, a few days later, Chen Zhenglei, who is one of the uh, major teachers at uh, Chen Village, he came out and, and said something very... Uh, supposedly politically correct, he said, uh, you know, uh, Taiji was uh, likely once used as a martial art, but nowadays it's mostly used to to promote people's health, so this is why we have no interest. And some people say that Chen Village are going to try to block him or take him down, that, that MMA coach via political means for various uh, Wushu, national Wushu organizations rather than having to confront him directly. But this whole troll feeding, where you got one guy on the internet saying, I'm the, the biggest gorilla in the forest, and then a smaller gorilla aspires to beat him and gets beaten up. And this silly argument turning into a national thing in China and implicating on the entire community of Taiji practitioners, both in China and worldwide, this is the backlash from all the magical shows and the magic tricks and the stage fighting on TV. Well, this guy that he fought, okay, you know, let me just be upfront here. I know the MMA coach personally. Um, and the guy that uh, he, he fought last week, this has been brewing since last year, uh, or at least since the beginning of the year. I mean, I can't recall exactly when I first heard about this issue, but it's been a while. 
And he's not a nobody. In fact, he was on one of the episodes of that uh, fakeumentary uh, about uh, experiencing real Kung Fu. He was one of the masters in one of them where he was beating up a foreigner. Now, now understand how this was staged, and you can understand the political implication. The foreigner at the beginning of the show goes into a Thai boxing school and beats up a Thai boxer, a professional athlete, right? And then they go to this uh, Tai Chi master, and the Tai Chi master beats him without any problems, you know? Uh, so you got to understand what the implication is there. And then there were other feats of magic in there, like uh, a bird couldn't fly out of his hand, he slapped a watermelon and there was no damage on the outside but the inside had been mushed up and uh, and anybody who has any grip of reality understands not only by looking at the combat but at these feats knows that it was staged and it was fake and and this guy was actually very active on the MMA coach's social media he has a, a social media account about MMA and whatever he was very active there and he was saying a lot of things and after this the MMA coach, after seeing the, the, the video, asked him if he's really able to do these things. And that's where it started. That plus the fact that that Taiji coach then made other videos on social media where he claimed and demonstrated with his student that he could release a rear naked choke that was fully locked up with one hand, led to this MMA coach calling him out on all of this and saying, if you're really able to do this, Let's try all of this stuff out. And uh, that's what happened there. So it wasn't so much so that he was a nobody, and it wasn't so much so that uh, this guy has just decided to challenge an MMA coach. Quite the contrary. He was just being called out on all of the, the fake stuff. And, and, and the MMA coach is continuing in that light. Let's hope he continues keeping it in that light, that he was only looking to uh, show up those people that are doing, you know, uh, acting like charlatans in fact so that's that's what happened yeah but well that's that, that, that's what you this. So, sorry it, sorry it, speak it up. affects the entire martial arts community what, wait know? wait by one you you were just uh, cut up a little could you repeat the the last two sentences oh i said what it shows you is that uh just this one loss uh, it uh it it shows negatively on the entire chinese martial arts community and had nobody made crazy claims with all those funny shows and things in the first place that is the root cause of all of this including the backlash so everybody needs to be responsible for their actions indeed but then you got this thing going out of control where it get when it gets out of china when it gets out of context so today i opened the internet on on an israeli news website you know a news reporter knows nothing about the martial arts whatsoever but he saw that video so he puts up a news article tai chi gets beaten up by mma and this is what the world sees you know because of these silly people because of the this this person calling himself a tai chi master and doing all this stage crap and now this implicates on the entire tai chi community worldwide you know yes. I, I i would i would go a little bit further i don't expect every single chinese martial artist to be a top-notch fighter that is not what i'm saying and I'm not saying that they need to go out and fight no holds barred with people every day. That is also not what I'm saying. I'm saying they should train correctly and fully. The way that we are supposed to train with all the elements that are in a martial art to train. To what degree and to what extent and how intense is up to each person. But the core thing that they practice does not change. Just the intensity changes from person to person. That, that That's the first thing. So this guy, he could have come out on the show, not presented any nonsense, but come on, and he could have still been, he, he could still be a Taiji teacher. This is not a problem. Yeah. But he needs to be honest with himself and everybody else about his ability. That's all. And I think all martial artists need to understand this. It's going to be very rare that uh, somebody that is a layman martial artist is going to go be the top UFC fighter. This, we're talking about two different standards of people. It does not reflect badly on the art. That is not the point, uh, and I, I hope people can understand this, but in general, the public won't understand this. It's yeah. very interesting. It all boils down to <laughs> wuda. <laughs> That's it. Yeah, so and, and, and what, and what you about don't the... have to You don't have to train to be an MMA fighter to be good at self-defense. That's and right. Self-defense self involves much more than just fighting. 
And that's where self-control comes in sometimes in, uh, in, in Wuda. Well, that's true too. But also, you can be a, a very capable at defending yourself in, a, in an altercation or a situation with an average layperson in the street. Uh, and your martial art could help you do that. But dealing with a professional fighter is another kettle of fish altogether. We need to be honest with ourselves and admit that. Earlier we were I talking saw... about uh, setting a good personal example. And I have to ask, uh, from the perspective of what the MMA, MMA coach did, is that setting a good personal example? So, yeah, say, for his students, right, they see the, the fake people on TV. He could have told them, look, we could be better than that. Let's show the world through what we practice and our approach that we are better than that. Uh, what did he do instead? He went on to just fight the guy. Which, I mean, it's a good and a bad even, thing. Even on, on look the... for the guy. The guy looked for him. <laughs> this is the difference. So in that sense, I do understand his point. Because this guy was active on his social media with a lot of comments and critiques and criticizing of a lot of things about MMA before the TV show. This is the guy who actually stirred up the hornet's nest. It wasn't the MMA teacher. I see. It I sounds see. like he got what was coming to him. Apparently in so. In general, I would. I saw an MMA clip a few days ago, and I believe that, you know, even at my age and my physical impairment at the moment, I would be okay at regular self-defense. And what does that mean? I saw an MMA clip a couple of days ago of two extremely tough guys going at it, each taking shots to the face that would look like they would kill a normal person, and each one just shrugging it off and saying, come on, and they just kept going at it. And I looked at that and I realized this is a different type of person than I will probably ever meet and recognized in myself that I would probably be ill-equipped, despite 40 years in martial arts, to handle someone like that. You pick the wrong guy at the wrong time who's cranked up on meth, and it's a different ball game than what we think of as self-defense. Well, that's where, that's where perception, understanding, and all those other aspects that we try to develop come into play. So you should be able to not get into those situations in the first place. But also have the logic and understanding that if you do get, because sometimes they're unavoidable, with somebody like that, uh, don't be a tough guy. <laughs> do what's best and, and easiest to survive or get out of that situation. You know, there's a reason I've lived to be 64. <laughs> and hopefully you'd live double than that. You know, I'd like to I'd like to add something to this whole thing because being in China, this thing has gone crazy on social media in the last few days, and uh, and again, and it's very interesting to see that uh, you know everybody knows the story of Ho Yunjia, right? I mean, the movie Fearless depicted it very well, but Ho Yunjia in general in China is well known as a hero who defeated the foreigners. And nobody looked down on that. He's a hero because he beat up a foreigner. You know, it was a foreign fighter, and what, whatever the case is. But when the opposite happens, when and I'm not saying that it was a foreigner that beat up the, the Tai Chi guy, but the underlying root here is that the MMA teacher is representing something that is not Chinese. And the Tai Chi person is representing something that is supposedly representing all of China for some reason. And because of this loss, they've taken it personally. They've taken it as a, as a direct attack on China itself. And there's been a lot of backlash on the internet and people uh, getting involved and commenting. And these two people represented themselves. That's all they did. And I, and I hope people can understand that and just get, just move, move on. He represented himself and the Tai Chi guy represented his claims and his himself and his ability. And that's all that happened there. So if Good people point. could just uh, stay with that in mind, they, they, they might uh, forget about this in a few days. Anything else, gentlemen? No, not that I can think of. One other point I wanted to raise, because it's in, in response to what Jonathan said that the Chen family said about Chen Taiji being only for health. Uh, and it kind of draws a full circle with what I was saying earlier about at least practice correctly, at least practice fully, and at least adhere to the original methods and intention of your art. Even if you don't, train to a high level to use it, but at least practice correctly. If you say that your art is only for health, then what is the basis upon which we decide to determine whether a technique is correct or not? Yeah, exactly. I wish he hadn't said that. Chen Zhang Lei said that. I, 
And Chen Bing said something recently in an interview that he said that at one time it was for martial art, but in our modern society, most people don't need it for that. And uh, so I, someone like someone like me who studied Yang style for over a decade and wondered where the martial was, then found Chen style, and my main interest in it is the martial. It's a little disheartening to read that, and but at the same time, there is some truth to it. This Most is people uh, who that do karate that... aren't doing it to go fight. Right, but they they probably can. Yeah, and, but this this is this is this is the, the the basic crux of the issue is that how you use something, how you use it, does not change the nature of that thing. If yeah. I decide to eat my breakfast cereal with a pencil, that pencil is no spoon. It doesn't become a spoon. It's still a pencil. If you're going to practice your martial arts and you have no intention of using it, but at least you understand how everything is used and you practice correctly, the martial art has remained the same. It's just your application of that martial art that might differ. But you cannot come out and say that that martial art is now for health because you've got some health benefits from it. On top of that, I would like to add that it is my opinion, which I think I share with many other teachers, that at least in the context of the Chinese traditional internal arts, without an, an in-depth understanding of the martial applications, it is impossible to understand fully the methods and the movements, and then also most of the health benefits would not manifest. Because this is not medical Qigong. If you don't, the arts were created as martial arts, and to understand them, you really need to understand the martial usage because that changes the way you move your body around. And that leads to the higher uh, health-promoting abilities. And I'd like to add one more thing to this. To be fair, the person who uh, helped spark this edition of the podcast with critical remarks about Chen Village people had that as part of his point, that... Some of what is being taught is a little too commercialized and watered down, losing some of the true meaning of the body methods and the, and the applications. And mm -hmm. there is a point there. For sure. There is, and that's a valid point, especially if you can elaborate and, and, and explain it. You know, the, the entire point about saying that it's got its health benefits, you know, I, I, I've, written, I've come up with a, a, a description and... A, principle upon which I describe, particularly Chinese martial arts, but it probably applies to most martial arts, is, is it's like a hand, and a hand has five fingers on it, right? Uh, Chinese martial arts has, uh, let's say, the small finger is, uh, is uh, spiritual, so there's a, spir a spiritual element to it. I'm not going to get into the definition of spiritual, I'm not saying that you're praying to different beings, but there is a spiritual, spiritual element to, to the practice of martial arts. Uh, there's an entertainment value to it. People do it because they enjoy it. If it, if it wasn't enjoyable, not many people would do it. But in general, there's an, a value of entertainment to, to practicing martial arts. Uh, there's a cultural aspect to it. A lot of us practice martial arts because we're interested in learning bits of a different culture. But these arts are, in fact, they are culture-laden. They have a lot of uh, culture within them that uh, they get handed down. Uh, then there's health and exercise. And uh, this aspect you get from any sport or any physical activity. You can get health. And exactly I, don't want right. to, I don't want to sit and say that this is now the basis upon which you should do Chinese martial arts. So health you can get from playing volleyball. You can get health from uh, running. You can get health from doing yoga. Uh, you can get health and spiritualism from doing yoga too. But what sets Chinese martial arts apart is the thumb. And the thumb is the combat application of the techniques. And if you cut that thumb off that hand, generally a hand without a thumb is pretty useless. And you shouldn't call it a hand if it's, if it's missing that. Chinese martial arts and all martial arts need all five fingers to be complete. And, uh, you know, that's why I get a little bit upset when I hear comments like it's only for health. Because why am I doing it if it's only for health when I can get a better health benefits out of doing something else? Go swimming, for example, you know, and get entertainment out of it as well, you know. So, you know, people need to not lose sight of what the thing is or what it originally was. 
simply because of the way we utilize it or certain people decide to utilize it today. That's very good. Good point. Jonathan, you have anything final to say? Uh, no, nothing specific I can think of. I've really enjoyed talking to you both. I think it's just fascinating that I'm in Illinois, Jonathan's in Israel, and Byron's in Beijing. I think it's really cool that we can do this. And I appreciate you That's taking right. the time. Thank you. Been a pleasure. I have a lot of respect yep, for both great of you. for me. Likewise right. for me to both of you guys. How do we get a hold of you? How do people find out more about uh, what you do? Jonathan, you've got a book out. I think you need to mention that again real quick. Uh, well, I've, I'm the author of three books. Uh, my first book is an international bestseller. It's called Research of Martial Arts. You can just Google Research of Martial Arts. is available for purchase on any Amazon affiliate website or researchofmartialarts.com. My second book, co-authored with my sovereign mantis, Sifu, uh, is called Spiky, Your Edge in Self-Defense. Uh, it's about a self-defense system uh, for women, uh, which my mantis, Sifu, has created. And my third book is called The Analects of Tianjin. The Analects of Tianjin is a book in Hebrew intended for my students and for the Israeli martial arts community, and it is available on my academy's website that's Tianjin, T-I-A-N-J-I-N dot C-O dot I-L, that's my academy's website. Otherwise, you can find me on Facebook, Jonathan Blustein, or jonathan.blustein at gmail.com. Byron, what do you have going? How do we find out more about you? Well, um, in general, I don't have an academy. I'm, uh, I'm with my teacher, and I, I practice and study with him, but I've created a website for people that are looking to find him and come practice with him in Beijing. Uh, that is www.dguoyungwushu.com. Um, I'm sure if you put it in the show notes, it'll be easier than me trying to spell it out here. Um, and through that, you're able to send a message, get in contact with me, or I'm on Facebook as Byron Jacobs. I am writing a book, which is a translation of the Xingyi Quan classics based on uh, three different versions of old manuals that we've now compiled together to find differences and similarities to put up some holes and it's a new translation with uh, annotations and notes on meaning that's been in the work for quite a few years and i'm planning on finishing it this year but like any writer you're never fully satisfied with something when you relook at it and i i hope to finish it this year and i will let you know first when when it's ready that's great all right yeah that that sounds like another program coming up um, uh, thank uh, you guys. Ken, if, if you just let me, I would like to highly recommend both Byron and his teacher, Master Di Guoyong, as uh, just cheerful, wonderful human beings. Uh, I've met with them both at Byron's invitation in Beijing back in 2014. Dear Shifu, the kindest gentleman, just such a pleasure to talk with such a person. Uh, this is being said of him of basically everyone who meets him old school traditional chinese martial arts teacher chinese martial arts master very rare to find people like this today in china and worldwide so if you find yourself heading to beijing or the general area you want to have a trip to china and study with a genuine master and also um you can get some tillage from byron himself and train with him then this is the place to go for Xin Yi Tren and traditional Bagua Zhang. Just wonderful people. Just go visit them if you can. Sounds great. That's much appreciated. Thank you, Jonathan. We enjoyed our time with you, too. Thank you, guys. Have a good one. Have a great you day. Too. Good night. All right, wrapping up, Wuda is not just something we read about. Martial morality is not just something we give lip service to. It's something we live. At least it should be. And it's something we all need to work harder at. And remember that the next time you get on Facebook and see another martial artist in a video clip. Sometimes your criticism of someone who is honestly trying to do their art is much more a reflection on you than it is on them. We'll talk again soon. Keep sending me guest suggestions. And until next time, develop your character, develop your skill, but most importantly, Remain centered at all times. Thank you for listening to the Internal Fighting Arts Podcast with Ken Gullett. For more information and instruction that will deepen your insight and skill, subscribe to Ken's blog at internalfightingartsblog.com.
You can also follow Ken's Internal Fighting Arts Facebook page. And if you want step-by-step instruction in Chen Tai Chi, Jing Yi, Bakwa, Qigong, and more, try two weeks free on Ken's online school, where you will receive complete access to more than 800 video lessons, the equivalent of more than 65 DVDs, plus eBooks and more. Go to internalfightingarts.com.